Johnson is the forgotten man of 17th century British art. That's him. Prolific and successful in his lifetime, his works are found in most public collections in Britain. Uh, often it must be said in their stores rather than on display. And portraits by Johnson are still in many private, Brit private British collections on the walls of country houses. They're frequently still in the possession of the descendants of the original cities. All his known surviving works are portraits. Uh, and there's a handful of portrait-related drawings. Although he lived and worked in Britain and the Netherlands, he's been surprisingly neglect neglected in both British and Dutch art history. As a painter at Charles I's court, he had the misfortune first to be overshadowed by the superstar Anthony Van Dyck, and then to find his British career curtailed by the civil wars. British art historians have only rarely addressed his work. Perhaps, I think, I'm willing to have to tackle his Dutch period career as well. While few Dutch scholars have been interested in his earlier career in England, 24 years long. Indeed, it was only in 2012 that the first English period works by Johnson, and these are they, entered a Dutch public collection. And the book that uh, is hopefully being launched tonight is the first book to focus solely on Johnson, and the NPD display next week is the first ever devoted to his work. To art historians in the Netherlands, where he spent the final 18 years of his life, he's known as uh, Cornelis Johnson van Koen, uh, and to the Public Catalogue Foundation and various other indexes, he's known as Cornelius Janssens or Janssens. Uh, so he has multiple names, but today, throughout, I'm going to call him Cornelius Johnson, uh, which is the form of signature that he used on his own paintings, and this is one of the earliest examples. Johnson was born in London in 1593 into a Flemish-German immigrant family. His baptism here is recorded in the records of Austin Friars, the London Reformed Church attended by Protestant, uh, especially Dutch, migrants. The next known documentary reference to him occurs in January 1619, when he witnessed a nephew's baptism in London, and his earliest known paintings also date from 1619. Johnson's cities came from the various upper levels of society. In 1632, he was appointed one of King Charles I's paintings. In 1643, following the outbreak of the civil wars in Britain and the consequent failure of court patronage, Johnson and his family moved to the Northern Netherlands, to the United Provinces. There, he joined the Painters Guild in the commercially thriving coastal city of Middleburg in Zeeland, uh, a very uh, a successful city at that time, but now something of a to today. And references to his presence in Middleburg recur during the 1640s and again in the early 1650s. He also lived in Amsterdam and worked at The Hague. He finally settled in Utrecht in the early 1650s <coughs> and was a leading portrait painter there uh, until his death uh, in 1661. His only surviving son, who was also named Cornelius, uh, also born in London, born in 1634, and he too practiced as a painter in the Netherlands, and he was buried in Utrecht in 1715. <coughs> Johnson worked on every scale, from the tiny oval miniature to the full length and the large group picture. He was the first British-born artist to sign his paintings as a matter of course, and he generally dated them as well which makes him uh, very useful in many ways uh, because um, he's shown uh, the sequences of sitters uh, um, in dated portraits. Although he constantly, subtly modified his style of presentation, as we'll see, his portraits are easily recognisable. The sitter's head is often placed unexpectedly low in the frame. The range of poses is carefully limited there's a meticulous precision in 
the handling of jewellery and of dress, and above all, of the lace collars that were such signifiers of rank and wealth in early 17th century Britain and Holland. And the handling of his sitter's eyes is often particularly distinctive, with enlarged, rounded irises and deep, curved upper lids. And I'm just showing you here examples of surviving uh, lace collar and cuffs, uh, perhaps not as magnificent as the ones as we see in Duncan's portraits. For centuries, there was retrospective confusion as to whether Johnson could be designated an English or a Dutch artist. And as a result, as I indicated, writers have called him by many varieties of name. A German artist and writer von Sandrart, in an account published in Latin in 1683, but written early, correctly described Johnson as a Flemish Londoner and stated that his parents had moved to London as a result of the conflict in the Low Countries and that Cornelius had been born here following that move. Late 16th century London had, of course, been full of exiles from continental Europe, many of whom were Protestants, escaping the re-Catholicisation of the southern Netherlands provinces. There had been one such migration in the late 1560s, following the Duke of Alva's repression of Netherlands rebellion against the Spanish Habsburg monarchy, and when, in 1585, the Spanish army recaptured the city of Antwerp, again, Many Protestant craftspeople and merchants left either for the Northern Netherlands or for other Protestant centres such as Elizabethan England. In 1706, however, the British writer Bainbridge Buckridge referred to Cornelius Johnson, alias Janssens, and this is where the problem start, as a Dutch artist, and in his short biography of Johnson, alias Janssens, he said he was born in and resided a long while at Amsterdam, from whence he came over to England in the reign of King James I. He was contemporary with Van Dyck, but the greater fame of that master soon eclipsed his merits. Though it must be owned, his pictures had more of neat finishing, smooth painting, and labour in drapery. Uh, and I think that's a very just um, description, really, of Johnson's work. And as we know now, Buckridge was wrong to say that Johnson had been born in Amsterdam, but from his style, it's extremely likely that he received his training, or at least some of his training, in the Northern Netherlands. Uh, Johnson uh, himself must inadvertently take some responsibility for the confusion as to what to call him, because at different times, and in the different places in which he worked, he varied the monograms and forms of signature that he applied to his portraits. Uh, and indeed, uh, the way in which he deployed his differing national identities in the art market at different periods will be examined later in this lecture. So you're seeing here um, two of his earliest signatures, <coughs> top, um, bottom left, a uh, signature from 1631, in the middle, uh, a signature from the late 1640s in the Netherlands, and then his final signature from late in his career. In 1634, the heralds at the College of Arms here in London confirmed that Johnson was entitled to bear arms by registering this five-generation pedigree, uh, which names his great-grandfather as Peter Johnson of Cullen. So that's at the top of the uh, script. Uh, Cullen Cullen. And according to this, his grandfather was John Johnson of the city of Antwerp, and his parents were Cornelius Johnson of Antwerp and Jane and Joanna Legrand. And this pedigree is our main surviving evidence of the family's origins. And the arms, which are sketched at the uh, head of the pedigree at the top left, comprise three green pallets on a gold ground. And there's also an elaborate crest of two green parrot wings behind a silver catherine wheel. And winged crests of this kind are apparently common in the Germanic pedigree. Uh, although they were probably a form of arms not given in Britain, 
they were clearly accepted by the British Herons. Now, I tried to pursue these um, inquiry um, in Cologne in the last few years, and was told that uh, if there was information in this, it would have been swept away in the um, uh, terrible floods that took place only a few years ago. Uh, so now it doesn't seem to be possible to kind of pin these down to Cologne. But Johnson's Cologne ancestry is significant because later in life he would decide to word the signature that he applied to his final paintings, Cornelis Johnson from Cologne, as I said, uh, that is in Dutch, from Cologne. We don't know where or with whom he received his artistic training. Conventionally, he would have begun his apprenticeship around the age of 14, although in Britain, this seems to have been more flexible than on the continent. Scant information on this is, however, available because almost no pre-1624 records for the London Painter Staines Company had survived. Uh, he would have been aged 14 in 1607 or 1608, and more than a century later, George Virtue, the engraver, would, uh, like Buckridge, uh, also write that Johnson had come to London from Amsterdam in 1618. And his source was Johnson's great nephew, born just after Johnson died, so that's some remove. Uh, and the great nephew was a little known British painter called Anthony Russell or Roussel. So, this again may be an indication that he'd received training <coughs> yesterday. But on the grounds of style, the likeliest candidates for his teacher would have been uh, either a painter based in The Hague, a grand and Tosin von Rauschwein, or the Delft-based Michiel Janssen von Merowit. And interestingly, when George Virtue saw a portrait of Edward Sissel by Count Wimbledon, dated 1610 at Somerset House, and it's probably this picture, which we now know is by von Merowit, he thought it had been painted by Johnson. And so this neat finishing and smooth painting, uh, which Buckridge ascribed to Johnson, could equally describe the works produced in the large von Merwald studio. Most of Johnson's early works are hidden shown as portraits, uh, very often seen as if through a famed stone only. This is a format that seems to have been a popular one in England from about 1600 onwards. So when Johnson returned here, he evidently embraced it. And of course, such a portrait was comparatively quick to paint. It therefore cost less to commission. Obviously a good strategy for an artist entering a new market. Johnson's earliest paintings are also quite variable in style and in appearance. Um, generally, like uh, well, both these portraits. Uh, the one on the left, particularly, an unknown woman uh, with an erroneous later inscription at the bottom saying it's the Countess of Arundel, which anyone who knows what the Countess of Arundel looks like knows that she doesn't, <laughs> didn't look at all like this. Um, but with these rather ostentatious signatures in the bottom right hand spandle, Cornelius Johnson fake it and the date, or CJ, fake it. Obviously that is in Latin, maybe, maybe it's. When Johnson returned to London, as we presume, at the end of 1618 or very early 1619, the market there was still principally one for portraits. But it was something of a transitional moment. And the leading English born and English trained court portraitists, Robert Pitt the Elder and William Larkin, were both to die during 1619. And in fact, the main remaining painters in London were soon to be the second generation Netherlandish migrants, people like Marcus Berks the Younger, who had been born in Bruges but brought to England in around 1568 by his exiled Protestant father. So in that first wave of exiles leaving uh, Flanders. It's clear that these painters ran busy London studios with a number of personnel in them, and that collaborations between practitioners were common, although evidence 
as to how exactly this worked is lacking. But all these artists were, at this point, being superseded in fashion by a handful of younger, newly arrived painters who had been both born and trained in the Netherlands. Uh, the most prolific and longest lasting of these income portraitists was Daniel Mighton, born into a family of artists in Delft, uh, possibly received training in von Mirabelt, and who was in London uh, by August 1618. He first painted the king, James I, in 1621, and in 1624, James awarded him an annual pension. Uh, at his accession in 1625, Charles I appointed Michaels his picture drawer for life, though it didn't actually work out that way, and for a number of years thereafter, he was regularly paid for portraits of uh, the king for official use. So, in 1619, Johnson would have been very aware well that there were fresh opportunities at the top of the market, especially for Netherlands trained painters. In 1622, when Johnson married uh, a woman called Elizabeth Beck, who was herself from a migrant family based in Colchester, which also had a large Dutch community, he was living in the London parish of St Anne Blackfriars. This was popular with immigrant craftspeople of many trades because it was outside the jurisdiction of the guilds of the city of London. So Johnson would have been part of a mutually supportive immigrant community. Another resident was a leading goldsmith, Nicasius uh, Russell or Roussel, formerly of Bruges, who in 1604 had married Johnson's sister Clara. Um, an extremely successful jeweler, Nicasius supplied the court and may have been a good source of useful contacts for Johnson. Uh, Nicasius and Clara had an enormous family, um, including a son, Theodore, born in 1614, who also became a painter and is said to have trained with Johnson. Certainly in January 1625, Johnson took on an apprentice whose name is recorded as John Evans, and we don't really know anything else about him. But during the 1620s, Johnson was extremely busy producing portraits for an increasingly uh, elevated, uh, uh, socially elevated clientele. And his portraits vary considerably in quality, suggesting that at certain periods, he was making considerable use of his assistants. A document of 1626 records that his residence in Black Friars was, quote, going down to the waterside, so it's by the River Thames. Interestingly, <coughs> to what we know of the property at Blackfriars that Charles I would later provide for Van Dyck <coughs> after the Antwerp trained artist uh, had come to London, had come back to London to work for him in 1632. In 1635, 20 pounds was spent on making, quote, a new cause of the ten foot broad and a new pair of stairs up into Van Dyck's garden so that the king could go ashore from the royal barge, quote, to see his, to see Van Dyck's paintings. Johnson's most assiduous client seems to have been the leading lawyer, Thomas First Baron Coventry, who evidently sat to him on a number of occasions, and uh, portraits by Johnson of him survive bearing various dates because he's generally dates. We can track those very clearly. Uh, the earliest is a three-quarter length of 1623. This is a particularly nice one, dated 1631. Coventry had been appointed Lord Keeper by Charles I in 1625, and it's in the parliamentary robes of a baron, with his hand on the great seal in its bag, that Johnson portrayed him here. Johnson also painted other senior legal figures, and in fact, he may have been the painter of choice for individuals like Coventry, who had risen from the middling sort and wished to mark their appointment to high office by commissioning a portrait. <coughs> Johnson's portrait of Elizabeth Campion here dates from 1631. As I indicated by now, I was using a more discreet, more discreet form of signature. CJ, or in this case, COJ, faked 1631. 
and that's where the signature is, much less ostentatious. And that's perhaps because he has now arrived. Um, he uh, doesn't need to, as it were, uh, announce himself in the same way. Now this picture is typical of the sumptuous half-length female portraits that he was now producing and gives every detail of Elizabeth's costume of lace, her spangled dress, and silver braided ribbons. This is the kind of um, fantastic detail that he was offering. Laborious to paint, but clearly very attractive to clients who wanted a portrait to be as much a portrait of their attire, their fashionable, uh, expensive attire, as of themselves. On the 5th of December, 1632, Johnson was appointed, quote, His Majesty's servant in the quality of picture drawer. But in April that year, Van Dyck had returned to London, had been knighted by Charles I, and very soon after his arrival, had painted this immense group portrait. It's Charles I and his family, the two surviving children at that time, um, and they are shown really for the first time as a family, not as individual in individual portraits, as a interconnected unit, stately, highly symbolic. We have the regalia on the table to the left, but interconnected, um, affectionate. So the little boy. Uh, patting his father's knee and pointing his father, saying, that's my daddy. That is the future Charles II. And the baby is the future, is Princess Mary. So this is a painting that really revolutionized this and other portraits of the royal family, of Charles. Uh, revolutionised the way in which the uh, royal family were being uh, represented. And Van Dyck's contacts here were, from the outset, at the highest level of court. So he very quickly found a large clientele among the leading court figures, the aristocracy. And Johnson, in fact, seems to have received only a few commissions from Charles. And then, the small-scale images, uh, sometimes miniature copies after extant works by other artists. Uh, so here on the right, misleadingly, is actually what is a very small picture. Uh, it's painted in copper. There are two versions of it. This is um, slightly more refined, but they're very, very similar. Um, they're very small. Uh, and it's basically the figure of the infant Charles II taken from Van Dyke's great piece, with one of the chain top left. Um, now Charles presumably commissioned him to be given as gifts, uh, because in both the prince is still wearing skirts, a dress, customary for little boys who were not put into breeches until the age of six or seven. Um, this is probably presumably painted quite soon after the great piece, after Van Dyke's big picture. And uh, labels on the back of one of these uh, uh, pictures <coughs> indicate that it was in the Hamilton collection. And uh, there's a 17th century inventory that actually describes it as the prince at length with a spaniel of Johnston. So at that time it was known as being by Johnston, though later it came to be identified inevitably as being by Van Dyke himself. And it seems that it must have been a royal gift to James Hamilton, later the first Duke of Hamilton, Charles I's master of horse, described in his own ODMB entry as the most important Scot at Charles I's court. Johnson also collaborated with another Netherlandish incomer from The Hague. We know very little about his visit here. Gerard uh, Halkheist, uh, in Dutch, Gerard Halkheist, on this, again, it's a very small following, it's Queen Henrietta Maria. She's depicted holding the lute within an elaborate setting of classical buildings, and that setting is Halkhurst's contribution. So basically the figure is by Johnson. And this <coughs> is listed in Charles I's collection in Vanderbilt's inventory, specifically as by these two artists. Um, so 
it was either commissioned by Charles or just possibly by the mayor to Maria herself. In 1639, Johnson painted these three exquisitely detailed, tiny formal portraits or many panels of Charles I's three eldest children. Uh, they're all in the EPG and they will be in the display uh, opening next week. Each child has a carefully chosen open air scene behind them. Thus, behind Prince uh, Charles, Prince of Wales, now wearing riches on the left, is a military exercise in progress. Behind little James, Duke of York, who holds a pistol, there's a hunt, uh, while behind Princess Mary is a garden with a fountain. They're all signed <coughs> and dated, in some cases the signatures are sort of truncated, but a mixture of signed and dated 1639. So Johnson was clearly still then working for the king, and in fact in 1641 he was still listed among Charles's servants in the royal chamber. Although in 1634 the heralds had confirmed that Johnson was entitled to bear arms in Britain, however socially and professionally ambitious he may have been, the overwhelming success of Van Dyck, his Blackfriars neighbour, presented him with a particular, with a considerable challenge. Uh, this is well known to many of the art historians here, I think. It's a way of demonstrating Johnson's problem. So on the left, we've got the head and shoulders portrait by Johnson of Sir Thomas Hanmer of 1631. Um, and on the right, the same sitter, painted by Van Dyck seven years later. So Johnson's image, probably painted to mark Hanmer's marriage, typical of his work at this period, accomplished, self-contained, yet it seems static when compared with the energy and the elegance of Van Dyck's uh, Titian-esque image with its dynamic posture and the free and spontaneous brush work. Work that I've done with you over probably the last 18 months has really uncovered for me the importance for Johnson of the community that centred centered on Austin France, the Dutch church in London. It was where he was baptised in 1593, when he was married in 1622. It was where many of his relatives were also baptised or married, events witnessed by other family connections and by distinguished members of the Netherlands community in London, some of whom Johnson would also portray. And in 1634, for example, these two pictures bought for the Katarina Convent in Utrecht in 2012, their uh, William Tia, who was the minister at Austin Friars, who'd been there since 1624, and his wife, uh, Maria de Fry. Um, and this couple had come to London from the Netherlands. Alongside his large-scale works, Johnson also produced portrait miniatures painted in oil paint on a metal. And this is not a combination of medium and support that other miniaturists whose names we know used in England. They, the English um, miniaturists, worked in water-based media on vellum mounted on a card, a technique that was often, then was often called limiting. So again, Johnson is likely to have learned this unusual specialisation overseas. Uh, and here are a pair. Um, they're actually set in a single setting, but these are the photographs I have where they're individual. So these are tiny little miniatures. Um, he didn't usually sign his miniatures, but his handling of them is extremely characteristic. So here we have uh, Theodoric Costa, Dirk Costa, and Jane Costa, uh, married couple, uh, depicted in this pair of miniatures of 1628. This couple had various links with Johnson's family. And Jane, whose maiden name was De Maestra, or Von Metter, um, a very distinguished um, Dutch name, she was actually Johnson's first cousin. Her mother was his aunt. Uh, like the Johnsons, the de Maestra family had originally come from Cologne, and Jane had married uh, uh, Derek uh, in 1613 in London. He came from a Flemish family 
that had initially migrated from Flanders to Middleburg and then to London. He was extremely wealthy. He became a member of the British East India Company in 1615. Uh, in 1627, he was elected deacon of the Dutch church and an elder in 1628. During the civil wars and the interregnum, uh, Dirk would spend time in Middleton, as in fact with Johnson. And Dirk's will, which survives, dated 28 November 1662, specifically mentions these miniatures by Johnson as, quote, two small pictures of me and my wife. More remains to be discovered about Johnson's relationship with the Queen of Falling Pennies, Adeline who lived in England from 1626 to 1638. Now, Hammond probably worked in Van Dyck's London studio, and certainly when he went back to the Northern Netherlands, he would help to introduce Van Dyck into compositions at The Hague, at the Dutch court. And while in London, he painted this remarkable portrait of Johnson on the right with his wife and son, one remaining son. It's probably painted in about 1637. So on the left, Cornelius the Younger is depicted like a little gentleman, dressed just like the elite children um, who Johnson himself very often portrayed. And later on, back in the Netherlands, Hanneman and Johnson would have similar clientele, including exiled British noblemen. From the early 1630s onwards, Johnson's clients also included members of a group of families living well away from London within a comparatively concentrated area near Canterbury, um, including the Campaigns of Coomwell, and we saw Elizabeth Campaign earlier in her fabulous green frock, the filmers of East Sutton and the Oxendons of Dean, and this is Margaret, the wife of Sir James Oxenden. It was in around 1640 that Johnson was commissioned to paint this large group portrait, and it's the largest, or certainly the widest, surviving portrait uh, done by Johnson in Britain. It's the first Baron Capel with his wife and their five surviving children. And it's probably been cut off at the bottom. I think you can see, we might expect to see um, more of the hands and legs. So I think it must have been a deeper picture at one stage. It celebrates the health, the uh, good looks, uh, the uh, fruitfulness so in the children, and the elegant taste, uh, the fashionable taste of the family. And I think you can see how the figures, figures in it are heavily influenced by Van Dyck's great piece uh, of Charles I's family. So, as it were, um, Lord Capel sitting there with uh, the child at his knee, rather like the uh, future Charles II. Um, Lady Capel looking rather adoringly across at him, as Henrietta Maria had been doing in the great piece. And the remarkable garden behind is that of Haddon Hall in Hertfordshire. And its inclusion at one level symbolises the idea of a well-regulated family, standing for a well-regulated country. But um, it seems that this garden is fairly accurately depicted because, interestingly, two other pictures, much bigger pictures, of this garden in the 17th century survived, and uh, photographs are known from the early 20th century. Johnson's work is particularly appreciated by historians of dress, because he tends not only to depict clothing in great detail, but also to date his portraits. So for, from studying, it's possible to trace developments in fashion by date. Margaret, uh, daughter of the wealthy London alderman William Halliday, had married Sir Edward Hungerford in 1621. The couple owned estates in Wiltshire, Somerset, Gloucestershire, and Berkshire. Uh, they were lady. Johnson depicted Margaret here in her bodice and silk of red, uh, bodice and skirt of red silk, embroidered in gold and silver, and with, again, sparkling metal spangles. Um, these painted and padded virago sleeves 
very, very up to date fashion, uh, original French fashion, uh, they're secured with this striped yellow ribbon. And she wears an extensive bobbin and lace collar, wired up at the back, uh, playing a kind of central role in the portrait. Um, clearly, a presentation that a wealthy sitter like Margaret would appreciate. In December 1641, Van Dyke died, and this should have reopened opportunities for artists in London whom he had already signed. But of course, the political situation was deteriorating, and the King and Court left London early in 1642. In autumn 1643, Johnson emigrated with his family to the Netherlands. Uh, according to George Virtue, quote, being terrified with those apprehension, apprehensions and the constant persuasions of his wife. So virtue to kind of blaming uh, Mrs. Johnson for this decision. Their pass to travel was dated 10th of October 1643, and interestingly, on the 23rd of October, the Dutch Church in London provided this testimonial or attestation. Uh, a document that the Johnsons would be able to present at any other Dutch-speaking Reformed church. So that's uh, indicating it's Johnson's. Uh, this is in Dutch, although it's from the Dutch church in London, and of course Johnson was a man born in London, he was attending Dutch-speaking church, and this document is, is in Dutch. Um, and according to George Virtue, he specifically says that on the 27th of October, they left London and went to Middlebury. And um, I'm very grateful to my former intern, Sandra Cost, uh, now back in Utrecht, who very kindly found me this document in the Amsterdam archives in December. We knew where it ought to be, and there it was. In Middlebury, Johnson joined the Guild of St. Luke, uh, he'd done that by the 8th of January 1644, uh, New Style, but it was in the Netherlands, it was the New Style calendar. On the 2nd of March 1644, New Style again. The records of the English church in Middleburg state that as passengers, visitors, were admitted Mr. Cornelis Johnson, his wife, and maidservant, upon review of attestation from the Dutch church at London. During 1644, Johnson signed and dated the companion half-length portraits of Apollonius of Vett um, and his wife, which I'm, I'm not showing them to show you Apollonius. Uh, this must have been a prestigious commission for Johnson, because in 1644, Vett was the burgomaster, he was the mayor of Middleburg. Why had the Johnsons chosen to settle in Middleburg? Together with Leiden and Harlem, it had been the city in the United Provinces that most benefited from the emigration of Protestant merchants and craftsmen from Antwerp and other southern Netherlandish centres. And at this date, it was, after Amsterdam, the leading trading centre in the United Provinces. The Johnsons, moreover, already had friends there. Dira Costa had property there and visited regularly. The pastor of the Dutch church in London, William Teela and his wife uh, and their family had returned there, although uh, William died in 1640, Maria was still living. Then, on the Sunday the 27th of August 1645, Johnson and his wife attended the English church in Amsterdam for the first time. And here is the record again of that. So, presenting that attestation from the Dutch Church in London, they seem to have become official members and to have attended regularly. Um, it's not yet clear where Johnson lived in Amsterdam, but during 1646 he painted a number of Amsterdam citizens, including uh, Jan Cornelissen Koelfink, who was a merchant, a shipowner, a politician, and who in that year was serving as burgomaster at Amsterdam. A long time. So once again, um, a very important client uh, whom he had uh, picked up very quickly. Johnson began to vary once again, to vary the form of signature that he applied to his paintings. 
So on Hairpins, he used the wording Cornelis Jonsson Longenus favourite. So thus, he was now marking him himself as a painter from London, this exotic, uh, new person coming from London. And the following year, having been commissioned to paint this, his biggest surviving picture, an immense civic group portrait, the Hague Magistrates, he signed it Cornelius Jonsson Londini, 1627. And it really is a wonderful work. Here it is in situ, um, in the town hall, the city hall in the Hague. And lots of Dutch people know this picture because this is the room in which they get married. And there is when I've shown a version of this lecture, they go, oh yes, I've got married in front of that picture. Um, and uh, the best man um, and the ushers stand to the left and they put the barrel on because otherwise there was brush and canvas pattern. Now, at the bottom of this image, I put in my not very good uh, photograph of that, uh, of that signature. In 1652, Johnson and his wife moved to Utrecht. Uh, we know this because on the 7th of November, they signed a document at their house in the Herentimate, which was a high status of grace. Uh, and now, as I mentioned earlier, Johnson began to sign his works, a different signature again, Cornelius Johnson from Cologne, uh, that is, from Cologne. Um, so this is a wording that's asserting another form of foreignness as his selling point, and this seems to have been the wording that he finally settled on and consistently used during the final decade of his painting life. And one reason for this could be that in 1652, war broke out between Britain and the Dutch. So obviously being a painter from London wouldn't seem quite such a good marketing for him. Johnson gained commissions from uh, members of the main Utrecht families, from similar patterns before, and was evidently accepted as a leading portrait painter there. And in 1654, he painted these companion portraits of the Utrecht resident Jasper Spada and his wife, uh, Cornelius von Linsbritter. Um, and Jasper was actually painted uh, before his marriage. Uh, he was painted by Frank's house. And once again, it's a very interesting and dramatic comparison between the different presentations. The young uh, Willem of Orange Nassau, uh, William III, was the posthumous son of uh, William II with Charles I's daughter, Mary the little princess that we saw earlier dressed in blue, who had been painted by Johnson in 1639. Uh, Willem, whose political position in the Republican Netherlands was insecure, uh, was frequently painted as a child, and this was obviously part of the strategy to keep his um, name known, to keep his profile up, um, in which uh, his various supporters and uh, um, his uh, grandmother played a significant role. In 1657, Johnson was commissioned to paint him, uh, so William was age seven. And there are a number of versions of this image, of different sizes and varying quality. And one of the best is the one here on the screen uh, in the private collection that no one kept, and it's signed and dated in the red paint uh, with this fine form of uh, it's there on the painting, and the image I'm showing you top left has been slightly digitally enhanced. Johnson's name appeared frequently in the records of the English church in Utrecht. Uh, just as in Middleburg, uh, he seems to have held office within it. On the 3rd of June 1661, according to its minutes, Mr. Johnson von Curlin was deputed to appear tomorrow. So this suggests that Johnson is still an active man. But a mere two months later, on the 5th of August, uh, we read that he was being buried. Twelve people carried his coffin, indicating his high status. So, initially Johnson had to construct a career in a Britain in which he was a second generation immigrant, a place that could not apparently provide a formalised training for a painter. 
Nevertheless, he found himself a sound technical training, apparently at least partly in the Northern Netherlands. He authored portraits on every scale, including a rare specialism, oil miniatures. He was perpetually modifying the manner in which he presented his sittings, often responding to the innovations made by his contemporaries, yet his work always re remains recognizably individual. He was prepared to collaborate with other artists, to make versions of other artists' works, including those of his famous neighbor in London, Van Dyck. He made himself the patron of choice for leading lawyers and public servants, and perhaps as a response to Van Dyck's metropolitan success, he also developed a regional clientele away from the court in Kent. He was adept at responding to external influences and changes, including some major setbacks. Clearly a pragmatist, he was always aware of the need to be flexible, and eventually this meant leaving the country into which his family had assimilated and migrating to the United Provinces. And there his changes of signature signaled successive reinventions of his artistic national identity as a marketing tool in the various Dutch cities in which he lived and worked. He also depended on the networks associated with the reformed churches that he attended, initially at Austin Friars in London, and subsequently those in Middleburg, Amsterdam, and Utrecht, where he died a prosperous man in 1661. It was a lifetime trajectory eloquently described by Von Sundberg. Johnson's parents, he wrote, had, quote, moved to London as a result of the conflict in the Spanish Lakers. He produced elegant images of the king, the queen, and the whole court. However, when the dispute which arose between king and parliament had extended to involve the whole of England, Johnson, together with nearly all the most famous artists, left England, moving to Holland, and there he produced many excellent portraits. Thank you. I think he's a wonderful artist in many ways. I don't want to 
rather than denigrating them. It doesn't seem to me that he was very pragmatic when he came to shifting basically the length of his career. Um, he was very consistent. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about uh, his regional clientele in Kent, and particularly any um, Levelandish connections they may have had themselves. Um, and that simply one for the construction of his earthwork. Um, but I was struck myself at it by, by the range of approaches to painting faces. I thought I knew what a Johnson looked like. The, the pallor, the slight effect of soft focus, slight blur in the outline, uh, and the contrast between that and the much harder outline that you see in the work of artists like Myrdell or Leibniz or Hontors. Um, but I now find uh, that when he wanted to, he could paint um, faces, um, I think, in, in a quite different style. Uh, my mum, and especially the two very late portraits you showed, uh, a gentleman from the 1640s, uh, one which one might think um, technically, very, technically very much better, certainly technically a lot closer to getting up close to the band dying. How do you think we account for this range of approaches? Do you think it's a matter of how far the studio is involved? to you now, thank you. Right. Oh, well, I'm going to go across the questions. Uh, okay, Lynn, on the, the question of the premises, basically what I, I, I kind of set up as much information as we have about the possible apprentices. So there's the, um, there's the nephew, Theodore, uh, yes, so there's this John Evans, maybe Evans and that, but we, we don't know anything more about him. Um, for this period, we just don't really know how artist studios in London worked, except that they clearly, they had multiple personnel. Somebody um, like Mightens uh, was really turning out versions of portraits, and uh, Mightens painted the uh, second Marcus of Hamilton, the Duke's father. I think there are 22 surviving Mightings type portraits of Hamilton. So there's clearly a big studio, but we don't really know who's in it or how it operated. So we can look at kind of Dutch Netherlands studios and presume they worked in a similar way. So we just don't know what was going on in the Hamilton studio. We know he was resident in Blackfriars, so that's presumably where the studio is. Um, it's close to Van Dyke. That area was destroyed in the fire, so we don't really know. Configuration of goods uh, or ownership. Um, so we don't know how the apprentices operated, but because his works can be quite varied, I think there was apprentice, uh, there were, sorry, there were assistants uh, involved. Whether they were doing clothing, I don't know. We don't know how it's divided up. The only slight indication we get is at the very end of his life when we've got all these portraits of um, William. And um, they're of varying quality. Um, there is one at Eastman Castle, which is actually signed by William Lewis Johnson Jr. So that's actually signed by his son. So his son must have been working in the studio in Utrecht. And there is somebody, um, I think it was an English artist who was in Utrecht, who also worked in his studio. But we don't know who that couldn't disagree more um, <laughs> because, as I was thinking, it sort of perhaps demonstrated that you have something like those very early, uh, the, the lady at Yale, who isn't the Council of Yale, and something like that. And they are extremely different, and he is very, um, and something like that. You know, this is extraordinary. I do think some of his Dutch. Uh, the sort of middle period of Dutch, which is all astonishingly yeah. accomplished. And it's extremely di different from that linear um, uh, approach that you're getting in the beginning of the 1620s in England. Um, there are eccentric examples. 
Because Johnson said 11, I just shown you very much the tip of my iceberg, and I've tried to pick images that were appealing, uh, appealing costume. <coughs> uh, but he does have a nice line um, in Gentleman uh, wearing shirts with a mantle, obviously in the sort of melancholy posture. And I think you will remember the one that has ended up at the Huntington. Beautiful again on the sitter, the wonderful contraposto wearing this wonderful linen shirt, a lace collar, and uh, with a remarkably characterised sort of expressive face. So um, there are many other eccentric examples of his work. And I really would contend that he does, he is a pragmatist, he is changing his style um, from place to place and of course over time. Um, Kendish, now that's a very interesting topic. Um, uh, Bob Tickler has done a, a little bit of work on the uh, Kentish sittings uh, that uh, Johnson had, but uh, it's Virtue who tells us that, I think he gives the date 1630, a date that isn't plausible. He says that uh, Johnson goes down and lives in Kent, and he lives with a, um, a wealthy merchant, merchant of Flemish heritage uh, called Sir Grimes. And I think the family came from Flanders two generations earlier, so they are both Flemish, but they are actually Kentish. Very wealthy, very much involved in building up Dover. Commercial buildings in the day. Now, Sir Arnold Grimes, in fact, bought his property which in Canterbury only in 1638. And he then built a very lavish house there with very little remains. There's just a kind of fragment. But, um, uh, and there are no portraits of Grimes or his family, so none of those survive either by Johnson or anyone else. Uh, so that kind of you would expect there would be lots of pictures of Grimes that Johnson had actually gone to live in. But after the Restoration in 1661, um, another Dutch artist, William Spellings, comes over to England. He does a lot of travel, and he stays with Grimes, and he writes a diary, a travel journal, in which he talks about this magnificent house and Grimes' his lifestyle, and he made some sketches. And they show this really astonishingly opulent house. And there's a particularly beautiful sketch uh, in the Hearth Museum. And uh, most of the sketches are in the end. But one of them is illustrated in the book. Um, so uh, it gives an indication. So uh, I think probably the Red Lanterns were pertaining in the case, uh, even so. Uh, and uh, Stephen, so the question of um, uh, the faces. Um, again, you know, raising the question of the studio, and I'm not really sure, you know, to what extent. I, I think certainly, again, if we go to the um, something like that, the, these pictures of women are hugely varied in quality, and um, I think we can see the studio there. And as I said, one of these is Sam Williams Johnson Jr., so it's definitely one of the same. Um, but earlier we can only summarize. Thank you very much indeed. I'd like to thank you all behalf of us all. It's been, um, for me, you've really brought to life um, a period and an artist about whom personally I knew very little. Um, I think it's very interesting uh, that uh, given the quality and diversity of his work, that um, he has, from what you say, been largely neglected. And clearly this forthcoming exhibition and book is going to fill an interesting and um, empty, or obviously sort of a slot that needs to be filled. And uh, clearly it is going to stimulate debate. We've already, we've already stimulated debate here this evening, which is always good to see, it's what we like. And um, I hope over the next uh, six months, when the exhibition is uh, up and running at the National Portrait Gallery, that many of the people here will go and continue to debate the issues with you. Thank you very much indeed.